earlier. Um, the superannual design uh, was fitted best to this session, but there was an oversight, so I gave that lecture earlier. So I'm going to give now the lecture from the previous session, um, which I'm sorry about it, which uh, was uh, how far should we push the borderline transformer access for tower techniques, equipment, and likelihood of glory versus gory. And here are the disclosures. And when we talk about vascular complication after TAVR, we have not just one, we have many of them. And it will take time just to mention them, but they are from stenosis, thrombosis, occlusion of peripheral arteries, hematomas, dissections, infections, ruptures, perforation, avulsions, dissections again. And even uh, embolic strokes to the um, body. And from the partner soil, we have this uh, breakdown of the frequency of these complications. And uh, number one, as you can see, was vascular dissection uh, and then vascular perforation, uh, access site hematoma. But that was uh, with very uh, larger um, seats we're using at that time. Um, and uh, they are com very low compared to that numbers today. And what is the significance of a vascular complication? It is important because major vascular complications have a tremendous effect on mortality and they um, double or even triple the mortality uh, when they occur. Whereas minor uh, vascular complications that they can be treated without any sequel do not uh, appear to uh, affect mortality. And because we can have many uh, definitions on um, vascular access complications, uh, we have to use some uh, unified uh, criteria. The VARC one were uh, used in the past, and they were like a more um, um, uh, acceptable widespread uh, definition, and even uh, and um, uh, some minor, what is considered today minor vascular complication were accepted as major uh, back then. And the um, uh, definitions we're using today are the, the VARC 2 definitions, where especially, you don't have to go through all them, when we have an unplanned procedure to correct something is not considered um, um, anymore a major vascular complication uh, when it is not associated uh, with major and permanent problems. And here you see the effect of this change of the definitions between VAC 1 to VAC 2. In the same study population, it went down from 11.7% to 7.4%. So today's major um, vascular uh, um, problems definitions um, uh, be become less in, in numbers, but as expected, uh, more uh, they have, uh, because they're more severe, a more significant effect on the outcomes. And you can see here in the same this study population, uh, when we um, take into uh, account the old criteria, the, there isn't any significant effect on mortality, but when we get um, the new definitions, then there is a significant effect. And because today, this is a study of today, because today um, um, the, the devices became really small, the profiles of the sieve, that's why um, the, the big five complications that they were considered in the past, the big five, and they had major stroke, bleeding events, vascular events, acute kidney in, uh, injury, and paravalvular para leaks, they are now seem to become four. So it seems that the major vascular event is not considered a major, uh, it doesn't have any significant effect anymore um, with uh, the new advances in technology. And you see how these numbers went down over the years from 15.5 to 2.2 in the latest partner to retire, major vascular complications of 2.2%. Of course, part of it is because of the change of the VAC definitions as I shown to you earlier, but the largest part, it's, uh, it's real and it's on to uh, improvements in technology. And here you see outcomes, various complications uh, after TAVR or surgical uh, 
aortic replacement in elderly people. And you see that what is really going down after TAVR is the need for blood transfusions. And the other bluish color here is the major vascular events. They're also going down. So we started from the 24 friends uh, seed profiles to get our devices in and we're down to 14 friends now. And when we plot these numbers, these numbers are the inner diameters of the seeds you are using. To get our outer diameter, we have to add three to four friends of these numbers. So the 18 inner is 18 outer. And if you want to convert these friends to millimeter, you have to remember that one millimeter equals three friends in size. And we hope that we will get in the future, and it's, it's realistic, it's expected, uh, 12 friends compatible devices. I don't think we can go lower to that for Tavr um, devices. And as you see, as the profile of our devices goes down, the risk of vascular complication also goes down. So what is most important is the diameter of the vessels we're going to enter. And we have to, ideally, we should have a one-to-one -one ratio between the diameter of the peripheral arteries and the diameter, the real diameter, the outer diameter of our sieve. But when our arteries are non-calcified, then we can oversize because they have elasticity and they can accommodate up to 20, 10 to 20% oversizing. So one parameter is the diameter, the second parameter is thought velocity, and the third parameter is calcification. When we have especially circumferential uh, um, calcification, more than 75% of the perimeter, then this is something that tells us that this artery does not have elasticity, is not going to expand, so we shouldn't oversize our safe compared to the true diameter. Uh, so what about uh, other approaches for these patients? Certainly it's transaortic, transapical, and subclavian for sure. But usually when you have peripheral artery disease, then the subclavian um, um, quality is not usually that good. Uh, there is also the disease there, calcification and ectasia. So it's, it's not very usual that severe peripheral disease, uh, you will see um, an acceptable subclavian from entry. And then if you had previous bypass operation with lima graft, then um, the subclavian has to be really larger. Um, earlier we heard from Dr. Cassell about the transcaval technique which is an alternative, and you can see here how the transaortic went up at the time that we were between 18 and 20 friends in our devices. So at one stage it reached 50% of the implantations, but now with our devices going down, again you see the transfemoral is going up and all the other access really low. In our own ex uh, experience in the hospital over the past two, three years, we have 95% transfemoral and the rest 5% are all the other access. And I think this reflects the real um, um, breakdown of the access used today. And there are algorithms su making suggestions about uh, how to proceed depending on the diameters of our arteries from MSCT, of course, always the calcium and the tortuosity. The devices we are using, the guide wire to uh, insert our safe must be stiff uh, so there is no uh, injury to uh, the vasculature. And usually we uh, have amplats extra stiff or super stiff lantroquist safari wires, the most uh, used. And the um, uh, large sieve we are using today are mainly the e sieve from Edwards, which is an expandable, expandable sieve. And it comes to 14 and 16 friends. The 14 friends for uh, these three sizes and the 16 for the larger one. For the Metronic, uh, we don't uh, use uh, a sieve because it has the incorporated inline sieve, which is 14 friends equivalent, so it's 18 friends outer diameter, but many times we insert the metronic valves through the 14 friends um, e -sith. unless it's Evolute Pro, and then we have to use the 16 e -sith. And then the Terumo, which I had, there is a, 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 a transient problem, and it's withdrawn. 
from the market, at least for now. Uh, access site infection is not a real problem when we go uh, percutaneously. It is a problem when uh, you go with a surgical cut down and then reports up to 12% site infection um, have been um, in the literature. And you can see here um, a direct um, comparison between a, a surgical cut down and percutaneous access and you see the major vascular complications are actually more in the surgical cut down and also the length of stay in the hospital is considerably more. And a, in a time that we live that everything counts on the financial matters and uh, when we go with surgical cut down the cost in this study, the in-hospital cost, is, uh, goes up by one third which is very very significant. That's why we avoid it. And then um, um, what about the closer devices we are using? We're using the uh, ProGlide mostly today and this is based on this study that showed a significant difference in the major vascular complications between ProStar and ProGlide. It was a randomized study and <coughs> in the femoral artery especially as you can see there was a significant reduction of vascular complications. And this is a meta-analysis of all the studies that compared ProStar versus ProGlide actually coming from here, from Athens, and that also showed uh, that the tendency there is uh, better results with uh, ProGlides. And here is a breakdown of the valves and the seats, and the Sapien, um, three valves, and 14 friends, uh, the 29, 16, the Centera, uh, that um, uh, is also coming into Greece, 14 friends, the Evolute valves through the inline sheath or alternatively through an 18 friend sheath or the 14 friends e sheath, depending on the sizes and the um, Pro, the newest one. The Accurate Neo, if we use a, a sheath, we have to use an 18 friend sheath, like the portico valve, the largest device of the portico needs 19 friends, unless we go uh, sheathless with portico, then we are 18 uh, friends that are real outer diameter uh, and for the accurate we have the 14 friends I see that we have started uh, to use and um, and it reduces uh, really the profile and I'm gonna finish with having some examples of uh, um, success and problems with peripheral access and starting with this patient that you can see the diameters of both the right and the left uh, peripheral arteries are really low, so we shouldn't really go according to guidelines um, transfemorally in these patients. Uh, also, you can see there are two stents here on both uh, common iliac arteries, um, but they have an um, um, inner diameter there of uh, seven millimeters. So we decided to at least try this patient transfemoral access and you can see the calcifications and the small diameter. So this is our initial peripheral uh, angiography. Uh, it really appears to be small. The, the right side was selected to be attempted and um, we were successful and we implanted the valve and then, of course, with the 14 friends EC with a very good result. And this is our final result in the peripheral with the two proglides. Uh, we have TIMI 3 flow and no uh, reduction in the flow, no ischemia. We have some um, transformation of the area there from our proglides, but no flow reduction and the patient did very well. Um, so that was success in a very small arteries. Here is another patient with very small, as you can see here, um, uh, right and left femoral arteries. So we shouldn't go, uh, it doesn't fulfill the criteria, we shouldn't go transfemorally. But after careful evaluation of the uh, CT imaging, we decided to give it a try. And uh, we did it our usual way uh, with um, um, uh, proglides and you see the artery here and um, uh, e we implanted um, a 23 I believe sapin 3 valve with a very good result and this is what we had at the end we had an um, obstruction and dissection we didn't really like it so in this case we had no other option than to ask our surgical uh, 
uh, fellows to come in and help us out successfully uh, with a surgical revision uh, in this case. And this is another case with also very small peripheral uh, arteries uh, that, uh, and a lot of calcifications you can see here. Um, and again, uh, problems in the other axis, as you can see, uh, subclavian N, we had calcification in thoracic aorta, so we gave it a try uh, from the leg. And you can see the problems there, so the small diameters, uh, but it appeared um, to be feasible. Uh, but this case, despite trying with a seat, um, a long time we were unsuccessful to get in from the leg, so we converted immediately to transaortic. We implanted an Evolute valve successfully, and so this is the advantage of having all the access available at the same time, at the same time, at the same place. All the team there participating in the procedure. You can try these borderline cases. And if you're successful transfemory, that's fine. If you're not, uh, that's fine again for the patient because he gets out with a valve uh, um, uh, implanted from uh, another access. So this is another patient with an abdominal aneurysm, as you can see, and small diameters, a lot of calcification in the peripheral arteries. And um, you can see, you can appreciate all these problems at the beginning of the procedure. Um, we did pre-dilatation initially with a 12 friends um, dilator. And there was a problem there, uh, a stenosis that was uh, preventing us from going in with a 14 friends EC. So we did um, balloon um, dilatation there. And then we proceeded, uh, we were able to go in um, no, we're not able to go in despite our balloon dilatation. And this is again, we converted to transaortic implantation of a sapient valve. So at the end, everything was fine. This is another case with uh, uh, grafts uh, in the abdominal aorta extending down to uh, the iliac arteries. And you can see their appearances. Despite the grafts, grafts are not a contraindication if everything else is okay, especially if the diameter is really large and you don't have extreme tortuosity. So uh, we jumped in and we uh, also succeeded in this case. We had to do a dilatation here to get a um, diameter that was desirable and we were able to advance uh, the 14 friends ECF and um, finally implant an Evolute R29, I believe, valve in this case with a very good result. And then get out our um, uh, Seath, as you can see here, uh, with a very good um, uh, peripheral appearance and without any complication. This is another patient with extreme tortuosity, abdominal um, uh, grafts, uh, that uh, we also decided to try to go transfemorally since we had the appropriate diameters. And it was a lot of tortuosity, but uh, with the Lantricoist Y, we managed to straighten the leg and get in the ECE, implant the valve uh, without any problems, and then remove uh, our seeth and having uh, this result at the peripheral vasculature without any problem, without any complications. And I believe this is another patient with grafts. Again, you see grafts is not a contraindication if you have and the diameters that are required. And here we're not very, very optimistic. That's why uh, we said we'll do a very uh, slight uh, effort from the leg um, for various reasons. And you can see here how we advance um, the, the 14 friends EC, the valve is getting out and then it's implanted and we finish successfully and with withdrawal of the seeth uh, with a very good result without any complications uh, in the peripheral arteries. This is another patient with borderline access. We managed again with the e seeth to implant um, an Evolute valve and this is the final result there. Uh, with very borderline and calcified arteries. 
And this is another patient that we also thought this, that the numbers would allow us to get in. And we did our um, effort from the peripheral arteries. But on, on that day, and uh, angiography, this is something we often see, the arteries appear smaller than the numbers we read on the CT scan. So despite that, we're able to get in, implant our valve, and we have this result at the end. We have some extra occasion there, but uh, with a lot of uh, manual compression, we had an acceptable uh, result. And this is our final result. So that was done with, as you notice, an inflation uh, of um, um, a balloon there. So for ob ob obstruction of the artery while we compress. And I think I'll finish here. I have some more examples, but I think the time is running. And thank you for your um, attention. Thank you, Dr. Spargas, for an excellent, as usual, at clinically useful.